Um, have, are there any questions? Am I going too fast? Should I go off onto a different topic? Okay. Um, yeah, with uh, Elizabeth Picard stuff, the thing that first got me on hers was FLO, uh, or FLO, which is the low table back there, and you realize that she's working with twist ties, which are the little plastic doohickeys that hold either a bunch of cables. They were initially invented in the 50s, so as to uh, hold cables together. Now it's the sort of thing where you go in to see any packaging. I bought uh, a corkscrew last night, and the corkscrew was I would want to use the tie wrap so as to hold it to the cardboard. And they're very industrial objects and so on. And then she herself is also using what's uh, the general term is fiber arts. Because flow is uh, basically a hook rug. And uh, we have examples that we're showing off to the students, uh, but there's someplace they're back there. <laughs> they're in the back. So okay, we can show you so that you can actually see how it is. But it's there. It's uh, if everybody's familiar with a hook rug. Okay, and which one, all she's done is use the tie wraps to make that and then flipped it over. And to me, it's absolutely fascinating how you suddenly say, okay, let me use this technique so as to make this object, which does not look anything at all like the original concept. And to me, it ends up looking like a lunar landscape, uh, something like that. And it's just sort of very spacey and um, you know, ultimately very beautiful. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we liked about the affiliation with Elizabeth and Mitch was that uh, both of them needed dark uh, rooms so as to be able to show their stuff because Mitch, with the lights behind the uh, smoke vapor, it's you need to have a high contrast in order to be able to recognize that the uh, much more smoke rings are there. Elizabeth, obviously, because she's giving her own light source, and so we actually were a little bit nervous when we were installing it to see if the darkness would make everything uh, acceptable for the, uh, the light from Elizabeth's would affect Mitch's and vice, vice versa. But no, happily, they all work together. Um, yes. Does she work with other, does she just work with tie wraps or does she work with other materials? No, there she works with a wide variety of materials. Right now she's working with uh, straws. Okay, but it's all the same thing. Like, she is based factory. based mostly on there. No, because Vortex oh, yeah. is not really it isn't really uh, what industrial. But for the most part, the new stuff is industrial. This is from oh some, pardon? <coughs> no, no, the year. I oh, the that. year. Yeah, I think this is about four or five years old, and it's made out of resin that got twisted and then cut. But no, for the most part, her most recent work, the stuff she's working on now, is using which one, lots of industrial products. It's, she uh, was recently up in Saint Jean Port Saint Joli, Saint Joli Port Saint Jean. Saint Jean Port Joli. <laughs> uh, and uh, she uh, was uh, made uh, these things that look sort of like um, anti tank, <coughs> uh, yeah, anti tank uh, mines from World War II, but out of PVC tubing, uh, which is the plastic tubing you use for. Uh, uh, your plumbing, and then painted bright colors and so on. And for her most recent work right now, what she, what the reason why she's unable to be here today is because she's working on a which one, one of these one percent for art projects, where she's uh, making a arch out of um, aluminum tubes. And it's the sort of thing where the maquette that she is using is made out of straws, and it's just absolutely fascinating to see how she just manipulates and put the straws together. And it's one of the things that I find. Fascinating about her is that for the most part, artists such as Kate will do sketches, uh, which are small drawings before they go and do big ones. For the most part, for the most part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Elizabeth does not do any of that. She has no sketches books whatsoever. She actually takes the raw materials, which is yes, what you're seeing passed around. Those are her tests, and she's much more like an architect, where they will make maquettes, smaller versions of the object before going large. To those are her sketches. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. She does her own welding as well, which I think is fantastic. And we were talking about women in the arts, and it's she's yeah, she's a force. It's, it's mm -hmm. pretty neat. No, she yes is wonderful. Um, and yeah, there it's. I've gone through the four artists. I think I've tried to explain. Did I Good miss job. anything about how? They, are, so I will ask again. Are there any questions? You guys know absolutely everything about, like, uh, I can give you a test after this and you'll all get A's. <laughs> so, yes? Um, so what became of your gallery? Is it, is 
it still in existence? No, the, ga the, ga else, no the gallery closed. There was when I started. There was uh, li there was literally I think probably I didn't remember at the time, but a, about a year before I opened, there was a front cover story on the Montreal Mirror talking about how there were no art galleries, no underground art galleries. That it was just the commercial stuff down in Old Montreal and the commercial stuff on Crescent Street. I probably read it, filed that away in the back of my mind, ended up opening the gallery and being the only one around. It was really easy to say, well, hey, this is a great place. Uh, you fast forward 10 years, at which point there were 20 of them, all within about three blocks of me, plus hundreds more uh, that were even further afield, most of them run by 20-year-olds with way more energy than I had. And so I suddenly realized, OK, I don't really need to compete, recognizing that at the time also I was just basically going through the motions. I had uh, definitely hit some sort of wall and said, OK, we're doing this. And so at which point I um, said, let's go move on to something else. Some of those other galleries that opened up, were they also running solo shows for the first time? Uh, they, were, they, they weren't as specific into first time, first solo shows, right. but they were dealing with young emerging artists. They were uh, curating their shows. They were coming out with catalogs and so on. And it was the sort of thing, no, it's right now in Montreal, there are, what, 400, over 400 places to exhibit. And to me, that is one of the things that makes it absolutely fabulous here is that there's just so many, not only places to show, but then by uh, which one, necessity, so many artists. So you mean counting the big galleries and everything? Going from some place like this, which uh, on certain parts of the Quebec government they consider a museum, uh, down to places like uh, the coffee shop, uh, the, uh, what call it, uh, the second cup up the road, which shows art. And you realize each of them probably does about one show every six weeks. So that means you've got to have 4,000 shows a year. Yeah. <laughs> I find it hard to find places to show, personally. Uh, the, 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 cat, the cat's in, uh, what's on, second cup is not exactly the best thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would wake people up. Yes. <laughs> About seven or so. changes at the Musée d'Art Contemporain, I'm all for. I think they've done a phenomenal job. It's uh, actually back when um, Paulette Gagnon got named, because it's Marc Mayer now runs the National Gallery out in Ottawa, and Guy Cogeval now runs the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, and so they both have had changes. That The Musée d'Art Contemporain, Paulette Gagnon was named director, and I liked that there was a brief time when uh, all four major museums in Quebec, uh, the Musée de Civilisation Gatineau, the Musée, de Beaux Arts, Musée National de Beaux-Arts Quebec City, the uh, Musée de Beaux-Arts in Montreal, and the Musée d'Art Contemporain here in Montreal were all run by women. I thought that was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, but it was the sort of thing where when Paulette Gagnon got named, there was a whole groundswell of anti Paulette Gagnon stuff. And I was saying, you got to be kidding. It's they brought in somebody from the outside to run it for four years. So therefore, given that it is an institution that has, what, 100 people working for it to promote from within next, seemed a logical sort of just business decision. Unfortunately, that I wasn't uh, aware of, Paulette Gagnon had, oh, rubbed some people the wrong way on her way into the museum. I have no idea what it was or if that's the case, but there was a whole groundswell of support for other people than Paulette Gagnon because people were afraid that she was just too regional, too, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever. Uh, pardon? Incestual. That too, probably. <laughs> but it is the sort of thing where, um, 
the Musée d'Art Contemporain has incorporated the changes that Mark Mayer did, which were very much to try and get it down to the ground, get people involved, and so on. And so they have their first, they still do their first Fridays. I'm very pleased now to see that they are showing solo exhibitions of women. On the flip side, I'm very, very disappointed with the Musée des Beaux Arts, where it's the sort of thing where um, this is all me guessing at why Guy Cogeval left. There is absolutely no shred of evidence, but it's me trying to make sense of stuff. Because if you all notice, what, back in September, uh, they did the whole launch of the new uh, Bougie Pavilion, and uh, they have the concert hall, and if any of, you have, any of you have been there now, they have speakers in all their galleries blaring music at you, which somebody has <laughs> decided makes the art go down better. Uh, from what I've heard, the Bougie family could care less about visual art, but they had lots and lots of money. And the, uh, my guess is that the board of directors, somebody there was successful in convincing the Bougie family to buy the Erskine and American Church and help build the uh, new Canadian Art Pavilion. But given that the Bougies didn't like visual art, they said, well, we really like music. And so a sort of entente deal was made. You, you stick music in here, and we'll give you money for the art as well. And um, yeah, back when Guy Cogeval was uh, which one, director, the museum would regularly trade exhibitions with uh, the Smithsonian in Washington, the Hermitage in Moscow. Uh, they'd be doing museums in uh, Paris, like they were going out of style. Uh, now it's uh, they're trading exhibitions with uh, the muse, what the uh, Cincinnati Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, which one? The, the um, uh, Jean Paul Gaultier went down to uh, Houston and or Dallas, and everybody's saying, "Ooh, this is a great thing." Uh, to me, it's the Musée des Beaux Arts has suffered greatly, and um, yeah, I wish I was in a position to do something about it because they are a kick-ass institution and they have some wonderful, wonderful work there. But it's, yeah, this insistence on doing much more stuff with music just drives me up the wall. Uh, and then the fact that they are no longer on the same, I'd much prefer to think that Montreal has stuff in common with Moscow, uh, Washington, D.C., and Paris than Cincinnati, Houston, and Marseille. <laughs>